All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. Fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my man. My name is Carlos Arevalo. I play guitar and I'm a member of Chicano Batman. Yeah, yeah, man. I was just watching the fucking uh, mini concert. Oh, my God. Thank you. It is smoking. It is smoking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Where'd that. you guys do that at? It was at a sound stage in Van Nuys. Um, and it was a nice open space. We got to invite some fans very last minute. And we just have a really cooking man right now. So it was just a lot of fun. Oh my God. The band is absolutely fire. I got to tell you something. It It is. And I love to admit this kind of stuff because, uh, I think there's no better pleasure than discovering something late. It's better than never. You know what I mean? And Chicana Batman was a band that I had heard the name for years. And I thought it was like a joke cover band or something, you know, because of the name. And I never, ever listened to it. It's unbelievable because this, this record is absolutely fantastic and it's everything i love about music i am a huge huge soul rock guy i call it soul rock you know anything from of course curtis mayfield up to maxwell and you know you get into all all the stuff even uh marcus king right now he's playing some amazing soul rock and i've i've been a fan of it all my life and I've talked about it on the podcast for 12 years. And I get this record yesterday and I'm immediately like, oh, I got to have these guys on right away. And I and I love to admit my um, my dumbness, you know? <laughs> well, you know, um, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, better late than never. That's definitely the case. I mean, there's I'm still finding out about many you know, amazing musicians and groups um, all the time and think to myself, where was, how did I miss this? You know, it happens. There's a lot of information out there. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I was just in a coffee shop in Denver a couple days ago and, you know, Shazam is just this gold mine and whoever invented, Absolutely. whoever invented that, give them all the money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but the best thing it's, it's uh, about was back in the day, if you were in a coffee shop or a record store and something came on, you were almost afraid to ask the person because they would just be like, oh, what are you, some dick? You don't yeah. know who this <laughs> is? You know, like that, like that Jack yeah. Black stuff in, in, uh, in that film. But uh, so, you know, I Shazam something and, and here's this, uh, this guy that I'd never heard of from the seventies. And I listened to all kinds of seventies rock and soul and R and B. And it's funny because as many people that are famous, even right now, there's a million people that kick ass that nobody knows about. Yes. It's wild, you know? Um, so let's talk about this record. It's notebook fantasy. And it is absolutely fire. I believe it's your fifth record. This is our fifth record, yes. Right. And you recorded some of it at the incredible studio, uh, Sound City. Uh, Sunset no, it's Sound. actually Sunset Sound. Sunset Sound. Yeah. Yeah. That, the other Hollywood one. Yes. And it was uh, an incredible experience. A lot of history in those rooms. And if the walls could talk, you know, um, we're talking about tracking this record next to Prince's room. They call it Prince's studio. And that's where he made his first two albums. And uh, they have the Prince basketball court in the courtyard. And, um, you know, there was just a lot of magic in the air. And you just, you felt like this necessity to bring your A game because you're in this, you know, amazing space. And you want to leave your mark as well. Oh, yeah, man. I, I interviewed the owner of that studio and I could feel the magic in there. And, you know, Prince being one of my all time favorites, of course, he's delivering these great stories of Prince playing basketball in his high heel boots and, you know, <laughs> just killing it out there in that little courtyard area. But also people like Van Halen, Ted Templeman in there just recording some of the greatest rock records. And it's amazing to 
think about, I mean, they're barely hanging in there. They had a heavy homeless problem there in front. And uh, I saw that they, it got cleared out last week finally, which is crazy, but he has had a hard time getting clients in there because it's pretty dangerous around there. But once you're in there, you're in your own world, man. It is, it has yeah. that old school seventies rock and roll soul studio. Absolutely. It has these, you know, mixing desks, studio consoles, the board, and that's the sound of those records in those rooms. And those rooms are so musical. The acoustics are incredible. You know, you hit a snare drum and it just sounds like the record, the finished record already, you know, and uh, just to be able to play in there. It's just for a musician, for me specifically, I guess, um, when I record music or I perform music, if the sound is dialed in, I feel like invincible. I feel I can do anything and I feel like it elevates me as a musician and I am able to do things I wasn't able to do before. And that was definitely the sensation uh, recording in that space. It just sounds so good. Now let's, let's get a little bit into it. Of course, there's going to be some, uh, you know, Chicano Batman fans that come on and go, this guy's fucking, he's asking the questions. We already know all this. But I want to get into a little bit about how you guys started, because I had heard about you guys years ago and uh, you're a Los Angeles band. So the name came up a lot and I'm kind of pissed that people didn't go, you know, when they bring it up, they go, hey, you listen to Chicano Batman? I was like, no, you know, they should have said, <laughs> oh, well, you know, you love such and such, you know, you're going to love this. So, and then I would be like, oh, OK. But how do you guys start? Were you playing clubs or were you just doing tapes at your house? Because uh, it would be amazing to see this style of band play out at like the Mint or something. Yeah. So the band started out as a three piece. I was not in it for the first record, but I was friends with um, the sing with the with our singer Bardo Martinez, and uh, he was a fan of my band and a couple bands that I had at the time, and we were just colleagues in the music scene and had talked about participating together in some kind of project. And um, I think three years into the band's existence in 2011, he offered me an invitation to join because he wanted to focus more on just singing and not playing guitar as much. And um, we used to play, yeah, exactly. We used to play bars all the time. The main one we would play was uh, La Cita in downtown Los Angeles. And that was at the time, mainly a space for like dance music and DJs, you know, uh, culture. And we took, we befriended the, one of the managers or owners, his name's Carl. And um, he would just give us whatever night we wanted. And we charged like 10 bucks and packed the place and just grew an audience organically. We would play there like every four months and more and more, more people would come. And then before you know it, we finally started getting booked at places like the Silver Lake. Uh, what is it? Uh, the Satellite and Silver oh, Lake. Oh, yeah. The Echo, those places kind of didn't really book us at the beginning. You know, it was hard to get there because we've always been like this niche band in terms of genre and style. And we didn't really have peers at the time that sounded like us. So we were like this weird thing. So we didn't fit in with like some of the uh, general indie rock that was coming out of Los Angeles at the time. Um, so it was hard to get our foot in the door at the beginning. But, you know, like we're talking about just word of mouth. People would be like, have you heard of Chicano Batman? You got to check them out, you know? And also the fact that the band was pressing vinyl immediately, just DIY, you know, paying for the our own pressings and then slanging them at gigs. And then DJs would buy like bulk of them, would buy a bulk of them and then, you know, just spread the love through their travels and their shows. And um, yeah, before you know it, we, you know, went from those, clubs and bars to getting asked to tour with Jack White in 2015, which changed our life. And then that same year, we got asked to play Coachella. And we were like the only unsigned band at the time getting to play Coachella. And additionally, being like the only Latino group getting to play Coachella at that time, you know. And so it was a big deal. And we got a lot of national press that really spread spread the news and help us uh, raise our profile. Now, who starts sniffing around um, label-wise? Is it Jack White that signs you, or who signs you? So we got signed by ATO Records. And so ATO um, artist roster uh, includes, uh, at the time, Alabama Shakes, um, 
uh, I think uh, My Morning Jacket, uh, The Black Pumas now. Oh, um, yeah. Great. Brittany, All great. Yeah. Brittany Howard, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. I think some of Fish. The label was started by Dave Matthews like in the early 2000s. He, he's just kind of like the the figurehead of it now at this point that's the ceo is uh john salter and um yeah a lot of really cool bands are on there um and uh i think we got found out by them through our management so we got we ended up working with red light management who is a big uh company in the industry and they're kind of like a sister they're like it's like a sister like the they're like a sister company to ato records a lot of groups that are on ato for whatever reason are managed by red light and so because they had we had that in our our manager just kind of you know presented us to um ato and they were interested what an incredible uh roster that is because you know you got to give your hats off to that label because the bands you're mentioning alabama shakes king gizzard uh the black pumas these are all groups that i absolutely love and totally outside the box where it's, you know, it's not like, oh, well, where's the radio hit? Oh, they had hits, but not your traditional hits. And they had hits because there's people out there that want good music. So they're like, this is fantastic song. Uh, the people could play. Ooh, there's something crazy. They play instruments, yeah. you know, yeah. but um yeah, man, what a what a perfect label for you guys. And then somebody, your management or somebody hips Jack White to it. So Jack White, the way that happened was um, I'm trying to think how that happened. OK, so one of our, our biggest fans when we were playing, you know, the small clubs in Los Angeles was um, a keyboardist named Ike Owens. He used to play with oh, the yeah. Mars Volta. Yeah, I know. Ike. And he yeah. So he was also in Jack White's band and yeah, he passed away. Rest in peace. Yes, he passed away on Jack White's tour of Mexico. And so that year, I had met up with Ike. Um, I was my uh, girlfriend at the time, my wife now. We were in um, the D.C. area in 2014. And I saw like on Instagram that Ike had messaged Chicano Batman. And he was like, hey, I, I really want to talk to you guys. I want to get in the studio and produce a track with you. And... I replied back to him and I let him know, uh, you know, let's talk next week when I'm back in town. I'm in the D.C. area right now. And he messaged me right back. He's like, we're playing Meriwether Pavilion, which is in uh, right outside D.C. in um, uh, Maryland. He's like, come through. I got you. So my uh, girlfriend at the time, my wife now, Sandra, we went and Ike just gave us, you know, the just opened the gates for us and we came backstage and we're in the dressing room and I see Jack White who was like from the White Stripes and a huge artist that I was that was very inspiring to me as a young guitar player when I was in college and high school and Ike just introduced me to everybody and the band was very sweet Jack was very awesome and polite Daru and he also drums <laughs> yep Dar yeah. uh was Daru on drums at the time I think Daru was on drums yes and right. um because Jack had a rotating roster at one right. point. But yes, that was Daru. And um, he introduced, uh, Ike also introduced me to Lalo Medina, who is Jack White, Jack White's uh, tour manager. And it's basically Jack White's right-hand man when it comes to being on the road. And uh, Lalo Medina is like akin to, um, I guess, Peter Green was to Led Zeppelin, you know? Um, just like a, a manager that gets things done and is everyone knows who he is if you're in the industry and um Lalo took a liking to me and my wife at the time and he was like let's keep in touch he's like let's get lunch next time you're in LA anyways um me and Ike sealed the deal he was going to produce our next single we set the studio date and one day I'm at work uh we used to work as substitute teachers at the time because it was the only profession that allowed you to just miss whenever you wanted you just said you weren't available and there was no you know you don't get in trouble because when we would go on tour we need to be off for like a week or so and um i remember just substitute teaching at a high school and getting like this terrible text ike passed away today from um from a friend actually our manager at the time jorge and um I was devastated. Everyone was devastated in the musician community in Southern California because he had touched so many souls. And um, 
after the dust had settled and, you know, a couple of weeks went by, I was like, man, I got to reach out to his engineer, you know, and see what's going on with this, with this recording that we have set up. And I talked to the engineer's name's Antoine Arvizu and he was Ike's like right-hand man in the studio. And I was like, what do we do? Like, should we just scrap this? He's like, I think we should do this recording, like in honor of Ike, you should come in. I can produce it. I know Ike's style production wise, probably what he would have done. You know, I'll try to approximate. And I think we just get you guys in here and finish the job. And we went in there and we recorded Black Lipstick, which is our most popular song right. to date. And uh, I don't know. I just feel like Ike blessed that session, you know, from afar, even though he wasn't in the room. And that's our most popular song to date. And um, I followed up with Lalo shortly after about... Um, about uh you know getting lunch and i had told him that we had also just got offered coachella even though i had not been made public and i asked him you know what do we do like we're so green to this we've never had like a national profile gig like this he's like well first of all you need a tour he's like all artists that are playing coachella like warm up to coachella by having like a two-week run or a tour he's like do you have a tour planned we do not have a tour planned He's like, well, Jack White has a two week run going into Coachella. He's also he he's headlining Coachella. Um, let me see if he needs you guys, if he wants, you know, if he's interested in you guys, because he needs an opener. And also this band Anti Mask, which is oh, yeah. uh, members of the Mars Volta. Yeah, members yeah. of the Mars Volta, who yeah. also Lalo worked with. Good he was friends. Like, they of also mine. need a yeah, he's like, they also need an opener. He's like, let me see. He's like, are you interested in any of those groups? I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Of course, any one of those groups would be incredible, you know, an honor. He's like, all right, let's, you know, let's have lunch and I'll figure it out. I followed up with Lalo like a week later. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I'm going to see Jack next week. I'm going to ask him. Followed up with him the next week. And he sent me back an email. He's like, Jack's in. Let's do this. Two week run. You know, you're going to be following a tour bus in a minivan. Yeah. Or do we have a van? I think we had a uh, like a, a passenger van. And uh, we just did it. And it was incredible. And like I said, it raised our, our profile. And um, Jack was really supportive. It was a weird time because you're talking about this is 2015. So Trump is like starting to get his his wheels turning for a run. There's like that first, you know, things have changed, obviously, in the culture where you can say for, you know, people that are racist or misogynistic or what are hateful can say the quiet part loud now and be you know, applauded for it. So that was happening. And so we're opening for Jack White and it went great. Like we played great, but Jack White's audience is not our audience, obviously. And that's the case for any band opening a lot of times. And so we, he took us to like the part of the tour that we did with him was like pure South and people did not know what to make of us. It was tough. We needed tough, thick skin to get through that tour. We would get write-ups. We would read the write-ups of the shows, like the reviews, you know, and they'd be like just openly racist against us, you know. They had never seen anything like us. They didn't know what to make of us. You Isn't know? that People crazy? Twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty four. We're still. Well, it was twenty fifteen. Twenty twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still. I'm. I'm still. It's probably worse now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's wild that we're talking about the South, where some of the greatest, you know black music has come from and uh and 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 we're talking about uh you know open r racism uh and and what's really wild to me too is when jack white hand chooses the opener and the people are still like nah and jack white being a detroit guy which is um heavily you know mixed race mostly black and yep. uh and you know it, and he has deep deep you know roots in the music of having black uh members in his band or hispanic or anything and it's just wild that people can come to his show and be like nah fuck these guys and it's like hey man it, that's like saying to jack white's face fuck your friends you know it's yep. crazy to me man it is crazy to me and it also is so fucking real, you know, to it's hear and it, say it right now, you know? Yeah. And it happens whether race or is it a factor or, or not? You know, I saw Mike Watt open for the Chili Peppers at the Palladium, this underplay they did. 
and the crowd hated Mike Watt. And he's Mike Watt. He like yeah. influenced, you know, he's like an influence on Flea. And I remember Flea came out to solo on the trumpet and he was just flipping off the audience, you know, so it happens. And then you throw the racial dynamic and it gets a little more heavy, obviously. But we got through it. And I guess what I was trying to say was Jack had our back. He was like, you guys are awesome. Actually, you know, when we played the his homecoming show in Nashville, he invited us to that show because we did not play that show. He had a bigger stacked bill. It was like Loretta Lynn and the Rack and Tours were the opener. So we had the day off, but he invited us nonetheless to the gig at the at the arena. And after the show, he was like, hey, what are you doing, Carlos? He's like, Los, what are you doing after the show? I was like, uh, we're probably just going to go back to the hotel. He's like, he's like, I'm having an after party at my house. You guys want to come through? And I was like, of course. You know, yeah. so he was very um, gracious and just very supportive. And uh, at the end of the day, like what you're saying, that's what mattered to me. And oh, yeah. We did win people over it. And I'm not saying the majority of the people felt the way those, you know, the press was writing about us, but it was uh, definitely fans were made and heads were turned. And that's the point of music. I think, you know, you want people to reconsider their situation, you know, their viewpoints and try to open them up to something new and different. Oh yeah, man. Jack White is, I absolutely love Jack White. He, uh, he's a friend of mine and, and I know, you know, uh, I'm good friends with the, the drummer of the rock and tours. And, yes. uh, you know, it's just, uh, he's just a solid human and, and the way he loves to just find artists and put their records out and promote them. You know, he came to see me do comedy and he was giving me so much kind words. You know, he even gave me a, a, a tag on one of my, my Beatles jokes and it was, it was a great <laughs> tag, you know? So awesome. um, it is, it's just amazing, you know, that, uh, that what he's doing out there. So you guys played Coachella. You did the tour with uh, Jack White, his solo uh, tour. And then you start getting some pretty good traction or what, what happens there? Yeah. So we start getting traction. We get a, a, a legitimate booking agent for the first time. The, and the booking agent we have now books Krungbin, you know, and he has a lot of high profile artists and um, we get him. And that's what leads to our introduction to red light management is our, our manager, Brad was friends with our booking agent, John, and they had always discussed collaborating on some artists so that they could work together. And that's when John uh, introduced us to Brad. And like I said, we had a manager at the time, Things weren't working out. We were growing a little faster, I believe, than, you know, what they could handle at the time. It was just a big whirlwind, obviously. And um, John knew that we were looking for someone. And uh, he introduced us to, to Brad Sands, who is very popular in the Fish community because he was Fish's tour manager for like a decade. Wow. And so fish, head, fish heads are just fanatics. They all know who Brad Sands is. He's like in the documentary and there's like a bunch of scenes with him and Brad is also a artist manager. <clears throat> he manages his, uh, excuse me, he manages uh, Les Claypool and all oh. the projects that Les Claypool from Primus has. Oh yeah. Um, so there's that connection also, and um, yeah, that that helps us get our foot in the door. And Brad has the ear of ATO Records. He pitches our record uh, that we had recorded a year later in um, 2016 with a producer named Leon Michaels, who goes by the moniker L Michaels Affair who's been sampled by Jay-Z and all these other hip hop artists. And he's an incredible producer work. He just made a record with Nora Jones just very recently. Wow. Um, we make a record with him and we're just trying to shop the record and uh, ATO decides to come along for the ride and invite us on their roster. Now that's amazing, man. Uh, I mean, there, there it is. There it is again. You know, if you get a manager, who has been in the fish world or works with Les Claypool and stuff. That's somebody that understands how to work music outside the box. You know, that Claypool, uh, Lennon delirium stuff is some of yep. the best music I've heard in the last 15 years. I was just with Les on Saturday night. He came to, uh, the show at Berkeley, Bill Burr and I, and I just love that guy, man, because he is, uh, he is a fucking genius, man. He Just is. on anything. The guy flies airplanes. You know, he plays bass like no other. He writes music that's totally 
outside the box. I don't even know how you even think of that stuff, you know? And, uh, yeah, I just love him. And I, and I, I love people that understand, you know, these true artists, it's not all about like, where's the hit. I only understand, you know, you know, hit songs. So that's very cool, man. That's very cool. Yeah. We, um, we actually got asked to open for the Claypool Lennon delirium and oh. it was awesome. Oh, yeah. what a record was, that last yeah. one is. Oh my God. Yeah. They're so good. Uh, did you do a tour or just a couple dates? We did. I think we did two weeks. It was a, in 2016, 2017. We did two weeks and um, it was incredible, you know, just seeing Sean Lennon shred on guitar and also just hearing the stories, you know, backstage about his folks. It was like I had to pinch myself a couple of times. I'm like, you know, this is John and Yoko's son, as well as his own incredible musician in his own right, apart from that, you know. Yeah, he's amazing, man. It's wild. Absolutely. Yeah, I met that guy like, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago and had no idea years later I'd be just loving these records they did together. You know, it's it's yes. amazing. I saw his brother, Sean Lennon, or uh, Julian Lennon, on that first record at the Warfield. The, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, when I was young, man, I was like, Very I, young, love, yeah. I love that song. Crazy. Now, That's you awesome. play you play guitar. And yes. uh, I was watching the mini concert. I watch a, a tiny, tiny desk concert also and a lot of stuff. Uh, Fender seems to be your uh, your thing. You were playing a Strat on this uh, this uh, concert I just watched, but uh, Telly on some other stuff. You always been a, a Fender guy? Traditionally, I've been a Fender guy my whole life. Um, I like all kinds of guitars and, you know, I'm not... Um, like um signed with fender exclusively or anything i do work with them occasionally as well as the music man which is where fender went after fender oh yeah and they're incredible guitars as well and so i kind of uh depending on how i feel you know one or the other lately it's been a lot of fender like you like you um observed it's been the telecaster the neck humbucker it's just comfort i grew up my first instrument was a strat i played a strat because Probably John Frusciante played one in 1999, you know, or in the 90s. And I saw that as a as a teenager and just thought, well, that's all you need, you know, and um, grew up learning how to play on a Strat, always playing a Strat. And then when I started getting some money from being a musician, I started buying like Jaguars, Jazz Masters, vintage ones, reissues, custom shop. And somehow I just decided to get a, you know, a proper Telecaster, but one with the neck humbucker because the uh, original Telecasters, the neck pickup has always been known to be like a little anemic, um, you know, and uh, yeah, it's a great guitar. I, I love it. You know, all those instruments are just, when you get to a level where they're all that quality, it's just like a matter of, I don't know, just what, which one you feel like taking out that night. <laughs> Yeah, I love the uh, telly with the humbucker. That's, you know, Keith Richards played that a lot on the uh, Tattoo You tour, you know, and it's a great, great guitar. I love tellies. I love uh, strats. Strats are very hard to play unless you're a good player because yeah. it exposes everything on you, you know? And Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, Curtis Mayfield being one of my favorite of all time, he was a strat guy and, you know, he just Curtis Mayfield to me, even though he's very, you know, well known and uh, people love him, I still feel he's so underrated. You know, yes. the amount of songs that guy wrote is so, you know, so insane. And then his guitar playing and his feel really inspired so many people, even a Fashante, you know. Uh, yep. Big time when you listen to Fashante's playing, you're like, well, this is some Curtis Mayfield. And anybody with a wall and a strat that's not doing the Hendrix, but they're doing the soul thing, is definitely Curtis Mayfield, even if they don't even know it, you know? Absolutely. I was gonna say the same thing. And a lot of people, you know, they think they're um they're doing it because of because Hendrix did it, and Hendrix got it from Curtis Mayfield, like you said, and that whole style of chordal playing with pull-offs and legato and basically playing bass 
chords and melodies at the same time. That, that was Curtis Mayfield. And um, he's incredible. His catalog is just so, so deep and so soulful. Oh, my God. Anytime I hear soul, uh, so in love or kung fu, I just stop in my yeah. tracks. Matter of fact, Lenny Kravitz did an incredible version of kung fu. It is amazing, wow. man. You know, I got to check that out. Yeah. What a, what, I mean, Curtis, man, what a tragic story, man. Fuck. A lighting yeah. rig falls on him. I mean, this is insane. You know, like we lost yeah. a, a master. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, what about amps? Um, you know, you, you, you're playing kind of a soul style guitar. Uh, you know, what's your amps? So traditionally, it's always been, for the most part, a Fender Deluxe Reverb. Oh, great. I've had vintage ones. I've had the hand-wired reissue ones. I've had just, you know, the ones you can go buy a Guitar Center right now for $1,600. I've played those. And for the most part, ballpark, they always sound great, you know. Um, but I got hip to this company called Benson. And I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They're out of Portland. No. This guy has a – Chris Benson is the – the, you know, the the designer, amp maker, and he's just blown up so big in like the last four years where his amps are, have like two year, three year wait lists. Wow. You know? They're, wow. they're handmade, hand wired, the best transformers, the best, you know, capacitors, everything top of the line. And he is an actual player. So he he's really in, in tune with what, you know, a professional needs on stage and what they what they're looking for in terms of sonics and so his amps are incredible and i was able to get um referenced by him by this guitar player named anthony pirog who plays with this group the Mesthetics, which is the fugazi rhythm section joe lally and brendan Cant cantry um they have a like a, a like a jazz rock jazz punk group it's instrumental and anthony's the guitarist and he told me about Benson. He was like, you got to check these out. They're incredible. They're so responsive, touch sensitive, immediate, and the tone and quality is incredible. And he recommended me to Benson, as well as this guitar builder named Mike Baranek, who makes um, who makes guitars under the name Baranek Guitars. And he he's made guitars for Cage the Elephant, Unknown Mortal Orchestra, the Jonas Brothers. He makes these high-end guitars. And I had I had purchased one from him. It's an incredible guitar. Um, and he told me, he's like, you got to check out Benson. And I was like, you know, you're the second person to tell me that. He's like, yes. He's like, Chris knows about your band. He's waiting for you to like, you know, inquire. And I just never did. It took me a couple of years, you know. And finally, because um, I was working with Vox also. I was using oh, a yeah. Vox AC30 in addition to a deluxe reverb. I would use the two as backline, get two different sounds. And my artist relations guy at, at Vox was a really sweet person named Lauren Molinaire. And um, he was just hook it up all the time. He's like, whatever you need, I got you. You need rentals, I got you. Wherever you're at, let me know. And he was incredible, you know? And um, he retired. And after he retired, it was like, okay, well, you know, we're not, I don't really feel like an allegiance to Vox as much anymore. Right. And I think this is a good time to go talk to Benson. And so me and my bassist, talked to Chris and Chris was like, my crew is so excited that you guys are interested in our amps. They're all saying you're their favorite band. You know, what do you need? Let us know. And so, you know, we commissioned some orders, some custom orders. So the amp I'm using right now on stage has an image of a dove flying, a peace dove. And they silk screened it for me on an amp. You know, it's very custom, very one of a kind. And they were game and the amp is incredible. I, I just don't need anything else. Is it uh like 60s blackface uh circuitry and tubes? So it's very, very um uh versatile in the sense that it has two um it has two sounds. It has that sound, that American black, you know, blackface, black panel sound, as well as kind of a Marshall Vox sound, oh, wow. all vintage kind of style voicings. And you just, you, there's a toggle switch. So you can go between American, it says American and British, and you can pick between the two. And it's basically the footprint of a deluxe reverb. And so you kind of get like a modded deluxe reverb sound, or you can get almost like this hand-wired Marshall, uh, you know, G, uh, JTM 45 mixed with an AC30 sound on the British side, excuse me. And um, 
the amps are no master volume. So around three is where it's where I keep it. You just get like, this fat clean on the cusp of breakup sound. And then once you go past that, you get like, you know, distortion, great, you know, blues like distortion. And you just control um, the, you know, the cleanliness of it with your volume knob on your on your amp. I mean, on your uh, guitar. I'm an amp freak, man. I just I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really play anymore. I'm a comedian now. But when I played, I was just so in love with boutique amps and also just I loved blackface Fender, especially uh you know, Vibrolux 210 blackface yeah. reverb. Oh my God. Yeah. Just a great breakup of that. And, yes. and a deluxe reverb. They're just, it's amazing. This man did not play guitar and he nailed it with the Strat, the telly and the amps, you know, yes. the tweed twin, the basement, the Vibrolux. I mean, all of these from the, you know, everything he put out is still, the best right now <laughs> yeah it's a testament to his design prowess it's just what other like company is you know defaulting to their first designs to keep them like afloat still today nobody like you would go out of business if that was your model but for some reason with fender you know it's just like they can't make it better than that and so they just keep churning them out and they're great and they all sound very similar and it's it's amazing you know yeah. um but yeah the amp i play it's called the benson monarch reverb so it's very much like a deluxe reverb in terms of footprint it's a one by 12 big pine cabinet so it's very loud for its uh size and i think you would love it if you're because it's it's in the it's it's within the range of like those 60s designs that's the idea was make them like they used to make them hand wired person's there soldering it you know yeah and it sounds incredible yeah i mean you know mark sampson and matchless completely changed the game with point to point soldering again he brought back all of that and then people just you know started jumping on board and there's been some boutique amp companies over the last 20 years that are just fucking fantastic, man. Yes. And, and it is, that's just all there is to it, you know? Um, and, and then of course, you know, all of the Holy grail amps out there now, uh, some of them went out of business, you know? So you're like, Oh shit, I've got this guitar player magazine. Still. It was like the top 20 boutique amps. And it was from the like late nineties, you know? And it's cool to see the history of it. It's like, oh, this Rocket 88 one, you know? I don't know, you remember <laughs> that amp? It looked like a piece of furniture. It was made yes. from like Rocket, it had the legs. It looked like you were in a, some Rockabilly guy's house and it was his, you know, <laughs> stereo. But there was some amazing shit. The bummer on it uh, was a lot of it was way too fucking heavy, man. Like I had a matchless John Jorgensen 112. Dude, that thing weighed like 200 pounds just from yeah, the transformer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Vox AC30 was like a 60 pounder that I use. It was way too heavy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love the AC15. Uh, I had a, a vintage Fawn one. Uh, just one. Yeah. 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 With the black panel. And man, that's an amp right there. You know, we, um, we, uh, we did a live session at Eric Valentine's studio. Oh, uh, I love he, him. It was, He's still around? Yeah, he, his studio's not around, but at the time it was called Barefoot. And we did a, it, he closed it up, I think about three years ago. And now he's on the East Coast, I think just working out of his home studio, but, uh, and making designs for undertone audio studio, studio gear. And um, I remember doing a session there and they had an original AC30, like one of the first ones and playing out of it and it was the greatest amp sound i've ever played through then until now you know it was just incredible it was amazing that guy is unreal i mean you know i grew up in the bay area and you know he was out there he had that band t-ride and the three guys basically he produced it made this shit sound like queen man it was <laughs> unreal uh, yeah. They didn't really ever hit, but then he had, I think it was called the Crystal Studios or something off of La Brea or somewhere. He had so that that's what became Barefoot. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah. remember going down there and seeing him and uh, he's a genius, man. 
that guy, yes. he, he's up there with like, you know, those like jellyfish guys where they just like, they're like, how the fuck does this sound incredible? You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, I completely agree with you. And my bass player is a, you know, he's heavily into production as I am. And one day he was like, have you ever heard? the song i mean i've heard the song of course but he's like have you really heard the song rockstar by smash is it called rockstar um yeah. by smash mouth yeah yeah you eric know? did that right yeah he's like eric valentine did the production he's like Our i want Bono you to re listen to it yeah he's like re listen to it from a production standpoint and listen to how incredible the production the mix the whole package is and i did and it's insane it's incredible eric valentine's a, a genius he is, man. He is absolutely a genius, man. Wow. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, uh, your bass player is fucking fantastic. Now, who is that guy? Because I'm watching him, and I grew up on all that great 70s bass. I loved Lakeside. That was really the first R&B, you know, group in the 70s, uh, other than, say, you know, P-Funk and stuff. But it really had, it was a hit song all the way live. You know, and it just had that bass. And I was like, I want to play bass, you know? So yeah. who's your guy there? So Eduardo Arenas has uh, been the, the bassist from the beginning, and he's incredible. He's the best bassist that I know of, you know? And he's so funky, and he's incredibly musical, and he's got great time. And he's he's really in tune with the pocket. He's very, you know, cognizant of some if something's like, you know, a little too fast or dragging, you know, he, he hears all that and he incorporates that into his plane and he's just super solid, super inventive and very, very melodic and musical. I love that guy. Yeah. And he comes from a family of musicians and his uncles were all in bands and played drums and bass. And they were very supportive of him being a musician at a very young age. They gave him like his first bass was like a vintage, like SG bass that they gave him and like a acoustic acoustic full stack uh, bass amp that they used to have from their band and uh yeah he just comes from a family musician so it's very um it's second nature to him you know and he's incredible great artist he i saw uh i think it was on the jimmy kimmel where you're playing fly he was playing the uh, music man i love those old music mans you know just that that big yes. round kind of pick guard in the middle of it, you know, and the yeah, fourth yeah. tuner on the bottom immediately, you yeah. know what it is. I just look at it. And I go, Oh, Rudy Sarzo, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now yeah. I'll tell you the thing um, that I think that is tough with a band like uh Chicano Batman. And uh, if you guys have not heard this record, it came out, I believe March 29th, uh, listen to it immediately. Notebook. Uh, fantasy um, The thing about this band This type of music is the drummer It's tough to find a drummer Who understands how to play This kind of music How many drummers have you gone through? So we had a longtime drummer Named Gabriel Villa And um, he was just He's an incredible musician An incredible drummer We parted ways with him in 2022 You know it was a big hit for the group and at the time, we thought to ourselves, you know, do we even con do we even consider moving on as a band? Maybe we just end the band at this point, you know, because he's irreplaceable. You know, he's got a swing. He's got an amazing magic touch, you know. But, you know, when one door closes and other opens and we thought, you know, well, here's an, here's an opportunity for us to pivot on how we make our music. Before, at that point, it was like four people in a room. Someone brings a song and then everybody adds their parts and it gets filtered through the band. And sometimes that was a contentious, you know, uh, experience because let's say I bring a song in or our singer brings a song in. Sometimes you have, an, a, vis you have a vision for how it should go. But when you're with a band with people that are this talented, you know, sometimes you it's almost you're fighting an organic thing by not letting people do what they want to do, you know, inherently to the music. Um, so for better or worse, that's how we worked. You know, whoever brought in a song, it gets filtered through everybody and ends up sounding probably sometimes different than what was intended. Um, this time we thought, okay, we don't have a drummer, so we can't do that anymore. We have to write music, you know, demo it ourselves. The three of us have always been like the songwriters, Eduardo, Bardo, and I. 
reach sometimes collaborate together or we bring in songs apart and etc this time we thought okay let's bring in music each of us and instead of fighting each other or you know trying to put our own stamp on it let's just support each other in our visions and let everybody be their own director for the respective songs and so that's what we did with this record you know songs bardo our, our lyricist brought in he was the director. He was like, I hear it sounding this. I hear strings on it. I hear you playing less guitar on it. You know, I'm game. Let's do it. You know, and so that's what we did. And so this record also gave us the opportunity to be like Steely Dan, where we got to hire other musicians to elaborate and make our 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 presentations even greater and more hi-fi, bigger scope. And so we were able to work with two incredible drummers, one Tamir Barzilay, who is just an incredible LA session guy, incredible instincts, extremely musical, knows all the references, super funky, super soulful. He plays on one on majority of the tracks. And then on two tracks, we have Dylan Elise, who's a New Zealand uh, child prodigy. He was like, he won like the New Zealand drum championship at like 12. <laughs> uh, he's a grown man now, but. He also plays on the record. He's super indebted to soulful music, you know, R&B music from the 90s. He plays on the track Notebook Fantasy and The Way You Say It. And uh, uh, Tamir Barzali plays on the rest of the uh, tracks. But anyways, these guys are just cream of the crop. And we were able to hire them and just help us elevate our music to a new level. You know, in addition to hiring other outside players, like I play keyboards in the band. And when it comes to writing, so does Bardo. But you know, we play caveman keyboards. Like I can write a song with keyboards and a melody, but I can't do a bunch of crazy, you know, um, inversions and a bunch of musicality, you know, like some, you know, Stevie Wonder or Bill Evans kind of thing. <laughs> so we hired our friend, um, Quincy McCrary, who plays with Jack White. You know, here's the Jack White connection again. He now plays keys in Jack White's band. And uh, we hired him for some sessions to just really, you know, elaborate on the on the keyboard parts and, like I said, it, it felt like our Steely Dan record, maybe not, I'm not saying sonically, but just in the way we, we ran the show. We were the people in charge. We had our visions. We had this amazing wrecking crew of people to come in and just throw down and just elevate everything. And I think that's probably why, you know, part of the reason the record stands out to you, you know? Oh, my God. Um, you know, I always have this uh, this ear, I feel like uh, not an ego thing, but I'm like, okay, this is the hit. And when I was listening to it live today, I was like, well, this is a goddamn hit right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> I could hear it on, uh, you know, what's that college station? Hold on. I listened to the station so much and they, uh, here it is. You know, the sound. Yes. Oh my God. Those guys, that's some old school college radio, you know, like, yeah, they play the war and treaty and then they'll play like, you know, black Sabbath, yeah. you, you know, they'll play, <laughs> uh, they'll play black Chicano and then they'll play like, uh, uh, Lucinda Williams, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just like, I love that type of, uh, radio and, uh, live today. These are the songs that really knocked me out. Uh, live today, beautiful daughter, unbelievable. Uh, and then this song, I am a huge, huge Strokes and Julian, uh, The Voids. And I thought yeah. Losing My Mind sounded a little bit like it could be a Strokes or a Void song, you know? And yeah. I was like, yeah. that's really, it's in the middle of the record where I was like, hey, man, this fucking record is incredible. It was like, <laughs> Thank this you. record and a couple weeks ago, um, King Hannah, who I had on the podcast a couple years ago, if you're into Mozzie Star meets Neil Young, you're going to want to listen to this record. They got a new record out, Big Swimmer. But I think this record, uh, King Hannah and the Marcus King record that just came out, that um, Mood Swings that Rick Rubin did, I think these are the three best records I've heard in years. And uh, wow. I, I listen to a lot of fucking music, you know? I want to ask you a question about uh, you were, um, you know, on the uh, Talking Heads tribute, A24's um, uh, tribute for the Talking Heads, and you guys did uh, 
cross-eyed, which, which is unbelievable with money. Mark, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause you guys fucking kill it. And I love the talking heads. So, uh, uh, how did that come about? Yes. Thank you. Um, appreciate all those kind words. Thank you. Um, so I just got a call one day from one of our managers. We have two managers, uh, Brad Sands and Jason Gibbs and Jason called me and he was like, Hey, like, I have an in with A24. I hear they're looking for bands. They're going to do a Talking Heads tribute record to, you know, uh, pad the release of the Stop Making Sense uh, re-release in theaters. They want to, you know, do something fun around it by having a tribute record. They have Miley Cyrus involved, Paramore's involved, Bad, Bad, Not Good, etc. And they're looking for a few more groups. Like, do you think this is something you guys would be into? And I was like, of course, you know, please ask them, you know, if we can take part. And he did. He went back and said, you know, what do you guys think about Chicano Batman um, playing on this? And I think they went back and conferred with like some of the talking heads. I believe it was Jerry Harrison. And they vouched for us. And they're like, yes, get them. And so they told us, OK, we want you guys, but you don't get to pick the song. The song is Cross-Eyed and Painless. And we need it next week. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> so I'm the only, yeah, I'm the only member in the band who doesn't live in Los Angeles anymore. I live, uh, you know, the rest of the guys live in Los Angeles. I moved out of LA in 2020 to be closer to my wife's family. We're out here in the DC area now. Wow. And um, yeah, we started pl family planning and wanting to make sure our son had cousins he could play with of his own age. And um, my wife, Sandra, her, her, she has a lot of siblings, six brothers and sisters that live out here and they all have children and little kids. And anyways, so I'm out here in DC and, you know, I get the notice. Yes, you got the job. You need to start working on it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so book the flight, called up. Okay. Who can we get involved in this? You know, um, talk to our, our basis. And I was like, you know, we've always wanted to work with money. Mark, he's been a longtime friend and champion of the band. I actually met him in 2016 on that Les Claypool, um, the Claypool Lennon Delirium tour. He was the the touring keyboardist for that tour. And he, you know, he's such a friendly person and incredibly gifted. Came up to me, introduced me that the day that we were loading in. He was like, hi, I'm Money Mark. And I was like, wow, you're Money Mark. I know who you are. You've played on the BC Boy. You ripped the BC Boys, played on Beck's records, you know. The greatest. And um, yeah, he's the greatest. And uh, he was just always hanging out with us. He would hang out with us more than you hang out with Claypool and, <laughs> and Sean Lennon, you know. And we just forged a friendship, kept in touch. To this day, we still talk all the time. You know, every now and then we shoot each other a text or a phone call or see each other in person. And um, I was, but we had never worked with him on a recording, you know, and I was like, this is our chance. Cause I know he had worked with David Byrne on the William Onibor tribute record, um, Atomic Bomb Band. And I thought, you know, Mark's got the funk. Let's get him on this, you know. And when it came to finding the drummer, um jerry harrison and adrian bellu have a group called remain in light and it's a tribute record tribute oh, band yeah. that plays you know talking heads greatest hits basically and the drummer for that is this guy named mikey karuba and he is managed also by our manager jason uh that group that opens for remain uh, that plays in remain in light the remain in light band is a group called um uh, cool 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 and they used to be called um turquoise big jam band group and uh our 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 manager highly recommended Michael. He's, he should get Michael. He knows the song. He, you know, he plays it all the time with Jerry and Adrian. And so we're like, let's see if he's available. And he was available. So we went to Steakhouse Studio in North Hollywood, which is where we did the third session for Notebook Fantasy. We did all the overdubs there and all the string arrangements. And uh, we booked that place because they have an incredible Neve console. Oh, nice. And uh, yeah. And then two days later, we're in there tracking the music, the the four of us. Our singer wasn't available because it was such a quick, you know, get this done right away. He wasn't able to make the the tracking session, but he was available two days later to, to you know, hammer out the vocals. And so he came by the couple days later and did the vocals. And then we got it mixed by this amazing uh, engineer, Kenny Takahashi, who works with Danger Mouse. And uh, yeah, we had it submitted within a week, made the deadline and A24 was blown away by it. They loved it, you know, so it was it was a lot of fun. It was really difficult because that track has so many layers, so oh, yeah. many overdubs, so many memorable parts. And, you know, when you're recording a cover song 
I know some of the groups that did the tribute record took liberties and just redoing the whole song into their own, you know, style and aesthetic, which respectfully is amazing. And we've done that before too. But for this track, it just felt like, mm, I think we should just kind of just make the original contemporary at where we can, because it's already timeless, you know, and maybe just lean more on the funk keyboards instead of Adrian Ballou's like, you know, very bombastic guitar playing. And that's what we did with Money Mark, you know. Now, I didn't really ask you, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how old you are, but I'm sure you grew up and you were talking about Chili Peppers and I'm sure you grew up around the Nirvana and grunge era and all that. Um, yes. What were your primary uh, groups that you were listening to? Were you, you know, way into soul or because to me, I was I would listen to Prince and then I'd listen to ACDC, you know, I'd listen to uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. And then I listened to, you know, Van Halen, whatever, you know, but what was your uh, background on uh, the music? You know, how did you get into playing basically soul? Yeah, so I'm 40. I just turned 40. And um, like you, I just I never saw like there being like boxes and I had to stick with them like, oh, you listen to rock and you only can listen to rock. I grew up in the MTV generation of the 90s, you know, when MTV was really something to behold in the 90s. And I remember being like eight years old in 92 and I'd see Under the Bridge and think it was great. And then Nothing But a G Thing would come on by Dr. Dre. And I thought that was great. And then, you know, um, Smells Like Teen Spirit would come out and that was great. You know, all that music was happening in 92 and it was all incredible and futuristic and timeless. And I was just soaking it all in. I mean, it was just, that was my, that was my Spotify, <laughs> you know, it was MTV, whatever they played at the time. Not only was it popular music and huge, but it was really, really creative, unique and futuristic and just, you know, the shit for lack of a better term, you know, it, it's not that way anymore, obviously. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't even exist anymore, but um that's not how music works all the time now. You know, a lot of stuff that is great is not popular, but for some reason in the nineties, it was. Um, so I grew up listening to all of that, you know, and then in the nineties, I got really into, I had a friend when I was in elementary school, I was a fifth grader. I had a friend, his name was Brian Jones, like the guy from the Rolling Stones. Yeah. And he had an older brother who was in middle school or high school. So he was hip and he knew like all the bands that were, you know, coming out. And so he would share with Brian, like, Dookie had just come out by Green Day and Weezer's Blue album had just come out. And he would show me this stuff and I would just be in awe. You know, I, I loved it. I was always inherently attracted to music and just had this, you know, thirst to get more and more music, you know, whatever bands, whatever hip hop artists. And uh, that really got me wanting to be a guitar player was those bands. And um, I got to middle school. And I, I grew up in Rialto, California, which is an hour east of downtown Los Angeles, a suburb in the desert. And it's a primarily like the time Latino and black community. So a lot of the stuff that people were listening to was like hip hop, R&B, soul. And so when I got to middle school, I remember being like kind of teased and because I liked rock and people were like, you're like Latino. Like, how do you like, you know, you're Mexican or, you know, I'm half Mexican, half Salvadoran you like rock like you know that's white boy stuff like you need to like hipping up and listen to you know this stuff and i was like well i like what i like you know what is it you know what does it matter what i look like or where i come from anyways but i don't know if i was really trying to fit in but i ended up taking a liking to hip-hop the same way i did rock you know i just like i said i was always just if it was good music i liked it so outcasts had just come out with of course like you know at aliens equemini and then the roots had just come out with uh, I think it's called Philadelphia, and then uh, things fall apart. These incredible hip hop records were coming out. Jay Z's, um, uh, what is it, Volume Two, The Hard Knock Life, Volume oh, yeah. Two, I think, or, or, or Life. Someone, I forgot the name of the record. Don't forget the um, greatest <laughs> one, Lauren Hill. I mean, I I think that's the, that's greatest, the greatest one, greatest record made in that whole time. Yes. And yep. I mean, I saw her live, and I was just going holy shit this chick is an outlaw and she splits off puts her own record out and it is a masterpiece you it's know? a masterpiece and yeah, d'angelo was... at the time uh not hip-hop but d'angelo was the new curtis mayfield to me i mean i was like on i mean he did like an mtv unplugged or something i would my head was 
blown away, blown yes. away. Him yeah. and a Fender Wurlitzer, or, you know. Uh, yep. You know, I mean, a Fender Rhodes or a, a, a Wurlitzer, any of those sounds and his voice. Oh, my God. Unreal Incredible. time of music, man. Unreal yes. time of music. It's crazy yes. to think about it. 97, 98. Yeah. 97, 98. Incredible. Like you say, uh, Voodoo had just come out or that was like, I think, 2000, 99. And then uh, Miss Education, Lauren Hill. Those were super huge records that, again, incredibly musical, incredibly inventive. I was Macy Gray in love. Macy, Macy Gray. Gray. Yeah. Her debut yep. record. And yeah. and and then fucking uh, I, I mean, it was J Jamiroquai. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we could go on and on and on of like all these yeah. incredible song driven dancing R and B, but people playing instruments. I'm not one of those guys that are like, Oh man, they don't play it, but it's wild to see people play instruments like a earth, wind and fire. You are not going to see another earth, wind and fire, you know? Yes. Yes, it's, exactly. It's unreal to all like I grew up in the seventies. I'm 58 and the amount of, of um you know urban r&b black music all black players was uh a plethora and they were all incredible and they all wrote the shit out of songs man it's crazy yeah, it's crazy and all those songs still are incredible today you know they don't they haven't they all aged very beautifully but yeah, that's that's what I was into. And, um, you know, thankfully, I got turned on to that stuff. And I just went crazy for it, you know, just like I did rock music. And, and then when I was in high school, um, because of my love for hip hop and r and I wanted to I wanted to do something musical. And so I was really into like production and DJ stuff. I was really like had my eye on that kind of thing. And so I remember going to Guitar Center for my 15th birthday and I was going to buy like a $250 Gemini DJ producer like yeah. rig that they had, like a beginner one. Yeah. And I went there with my dad and um, it was the old bait and switch. Like the price had changed. It was like $300. So I couldn't afford it. I was like 50 bucks short. And I remember just being like, you know, kind of deflated, but then looking to like, I took a look to my left and then there was a Strat, a Squire Strat and a crate amp package deal, 200 bucks, you know? And I thought back, you know, I always wanted to play guitar when I was younger. Here's my, maybe I do that instead. So I bought the guitar, got hooked and never looked back. And that was it. I just got more into guitar oriented music, um, you know, uh, Radiohead um chili peppers obviously but i still liked you know like we're talking about you know d'angelo miseducation of lauren hill all of that was coming out um okay computer i just come out by radiohead bjork homogenic was out anyways just learning about these bands and then you learn about who inspired them and then i find out about bands like television you know oh, yeah Oh, yeah. joy division and then it just keeps going and going and uh yeah it was it's that was my that was my my schooling when it came to you know guitar playing and music did you see that joy division uh film control i haven't seen it i haven't oh my seen God. it you have to watch that because it feels a hundred percent real it's shot in black and white the dude is so dead on it yeah. is almost uh, scary how good it is. I, I can't recommend it enough. Now, here's something cool. You guys are going to play the LA form, the Kia form. This is unreal. And it's your first time playing it. This is our first time performing there. Yes. June 29th, I believe. Yes. And you're, you're kicking off the tour at the Moore theater, which by the way, where the great Bill Burr is about to shoot his special, and the Moore oh. Theater is so iconic. Uh, Mad Season and Alice in Chains both uh, recorded those epic concerts in there, those uh, concert films that just blow my mind still to this day to see those two. But the Moore is fantastic. So you're going out, you're doing some dates, and then you come home to L.A. and you're doing the, uh, the L.A. Forum. Now, I have done the Forum twice, and I can't even tell you how fucking amazing it is. It is, uh, it is goosebump, mind-boggling, chilling to walk in that room and know the Laker history 
and the Zeppelin history and all of the bands, you know, the Temple of the Dog played there like five, six years ago. Just everybody in there, the, the System of the Down show I saw there like six years ago. But the history of concerts in there, man, how great is that? Are you fired up? I am super fired up. It's like you're saying, it's multi-generational, the history of the concerts. My mom, is who grew up in Compton, saw Led Zeppelin there like three times, you know, in the wow. 70s, you know? Wow. And so here I am about to play the same, you know, arena. It's incredible. And it's a testament to our fan base in Southern California. It's always been ride or die. And they have grown with us from when we used to play the bar in La Cita to here. You know, the last time we played our proper headlining show in L.A. was in 2021. And we had two sold out nights at the Shrine Auditorium. So wow. when it came time to book, you know, our, our our return to L.A., we played last year with Portugal, the man at the Hollywood Bowl. But we were more of a support group for that. Um, but when it came time to book like at our first proper show back in L.A., we were like, where do we go after two nights at the shrine? And our booking agent was like, the forum. <laughs> and we we're like, the forum, are you nuts? <laughs> but um, it's gonna be a full night. It's gonna be it's gonna be packed, and you know, it's it's gonna be amazing. We're really excited. Now, who's on it with you? You got who's opening? So the opening group is this group from El Monte called the Red Pairs, and they're this group that's just been killing it out there. They have like they're very um reminiscent of us honestly you know golden voice was like you got to get the red pairs they're like chicano batman now when you guys were coming up and selling out every club you know across the united states people were they're that band right now and it'll be a cool like passing the torch you know nod of generations um having them to open so we were like let's do it you know and we also have this artist named lito pimienta who we actually the this leg of the tour is the second leg we just finished up a five-week run of like the rest of the country we did everything but the west coast in uh april and may and the artist who opened for us is lito pimienta she's the canadian singer songwriter incredibly funny incredibly gifted she is a director she has a tv show in canada she works with nelly Furtado. she's uh just extremely talented witty intelligent and just an incredible musician she's uh gonna also be on the bill Oh man, this show is going to be fire. I'm going to try to come down to it, man. Yes, please. I got, I got to see that. Now, before we get out of here, comedy, you a comedy guy? I am a comedy. I appreciate comedy. I, I don't, I'm not a diehard in terms of like always keeping up, but I do see like the big specials. And when I do see something hilarious, I, you know, I, I love it. You know, um, I've seen the George Lopez stuff like in the nineties, you know, the early 2000s oh, yeah. stuff. Um, it's great. Uh, Bill Burr is incredible. Um, yeah. I mean, I love comedy. That's great. Well, uh, if I'm ever in DC, we'll have to come down and uh, please, they, they got a great club there and uh, come down and we'll hang out, man. I'm looking forward to yes. uh, diving into the other four records because this record has really uh, made me happy the last couple of days. It's just like, wow, this is a great, great record. And congrats. And I love the album cover, the photo, the artwork. Beautiful. Go get it, people. You can stream it right now. You can get it on vinyl. It came out March 29th. Check out all their stuff on YouTube. They just did a mini concert of uh, four songs from this record. Uh, they played Jimmy Kimmel uh, a little while ago. You can check that out and go see him live. Buy a ticket. Uh, Seattle, they're coming your way here. Um, so everybody, uh, their tour dates are on their website. Thank you so much for doing the uh, show. And congrats on uh, your success. You're going to love that L.A. forum, buddy. I can't wait. Thank you, Dean. It was an honor meeting you and being on the show. Oh, man, uh, uh, I look forward to telling people about this record nonstop until they're like, OK, enough. We've been listening <laughs> to him for years. You're fucking it's like me with the Breaking Bad years ago. People kept going, you watching Breaking Bad? I'm like, no, I'm fucking doing comedy every night. And then I got the flu and I I watched three seasons in a row and I was like, oh, my God. And then I'm going around. Going, you guys watching Breaking Bad? They're like, <laughs> Yeah, like like three years ago dude <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny it's funny that you say all this because i always think this i find out from other people in the industry like oh yeah uh danger mouse loves your album or the black keys they loved your last record you know or 
Vampire Weekend, they're fans of you guys. And it's like, well, why don't they say it, to, you know, like on a, on a, you know, say it more so we can get more fans to get yeah. turned on to and et cetera, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, a, a one last question. I know it's kind of a hacky question, but the name, what was the, did you, did you run into any problem with Batman? Um, so, yeah. So our singer, he used to just doodle like in, in college and high school. And one day he was just drawing like a little Batman that looked like a Latino with a mustache, you know, yeah. wearing like a, instead of a cape, he had like a flannel, you know, like a, <laughs> like a little cholo. And um, what's up, fool, it, Batman. Exactly. Exactly. That whole, that whole aesthetic and culture. And, you know, it was just like a fun thing he did. And when it came time to, to name the band, you know, it was, he was actually making songs like little demos on MySpace under the, that pseudonym. And when it came time to name the band, it just, the band name stuck, you know, we, we weren't thinking like long-term or anything like that. Um, you know, just thinking, oh, this is could be a cool band name. But um, we had a logo that was an amalgamation of the UFW uh, United Farm Workers Eagle. It was like the oh, bottom yeah. of the Eagle and then like the top of the, the Batman head. And that was our logo. And we used to like make shirts and print it on our records at the time. And I think in 2015, so like, what is this? Like four years later after doing that, um, we got a cease and desist, not from Warner Brothers or DC, but from the UFW. Uh, the, <laughs> the Cesar Chavez you, uh, you know, United Farm Workers reached out to us and like, hey, you need to stop using this, our likeness, you know? And we wrote them back and we're like, you know, we apologize. We're sorry, we'll stop, you know? And they came back to us and we're like, wait, 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 we don't want you to stop. We actually want you to license it from us, you know? Oh. So you can keep using it and we both, you know, benefit off of it like financially. And, but we decided not to do that. And, you know, uh, I, I do know, like we've worked with like on some uh, Warner Brothers stuff, like we've gotten syncs for Warner Brothers uh, movies or content and they're all fans of Chicano Batman. There's, there hasn't been any issues on from them. <laughs> That's great, man. That's great. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. And uh, uh, congrats once again, and thanks for doing the show, man. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it. All right. I'll Talk see you. Soon. Have a good weekend. You too. Take see care. You.